I love my father, I love my brother, I love my family, I always, always do. Nothing of what I've done in this book or otherwise has ever been to, uh, any intention to harm them or hurt them. We don't want you to make stuff up. We don't want you to irritate people by saying things that are absolutely opposite of what they are. So that was Abraham Hicks, or me as Abraham Hicks, <laughs> expressing what we all feel every time we hear Harry on his promotional tour of the book, just saying things that contradict first things he said before and certainly things he said in the book. And after reading this book, I realized that this is a man who is in desperate need to grieve. He thinks by talking about his mother and having gone to therapy, which clearly didn't work, that he's done the work on grieving, but actually he hasn't. Because this unfelt grief that Harry's going through is just manifesting itself in anger, in vicious attacks against his brother, jealousy, envy, bitterness, pettiness, just, oh my God. And by the way, that's why Abraham is wearing the black veil because she's mourning on behalf of Harry since he can't seem to do it. So in this book review, what we're gonna be going through is different examples of how Harry avoids grief. And he does it through several techniques. First, this very childlike behavior and complete lack of insight. Wow. Second, the jealousy, which is mainly directed at William, and boy, are there examples of that in the book. Third, the magical thinking, this deluded thinking, this full of contradictions and things that, you know, things are being conflated and confused all the time. He really thinks he's in a fairy tale. Fourth, deflecting the blame and projecting onto other people. Like he's really, half of the time when he's writing, just like in that documentary on Netflix, half the time his critiques of other people could easily be used to describe him. And the last technique that Harry uses to avoid getting in touch with his grief is this kind of intentional vagueness that he does, which is sometimes just annoying, but sometimes kind of dangerous. And last, we're gonna wrap it up with some advice on how to properly get in touch with your grief, what you need to do. Maybe not for Harry, because I think it's a bit of a hopeless case, but we'll see. And the reason why we have to talk about grief so openly is because it's invisible. So we have to keep talking about it. Otherwise, people go mad with it, just like Harry. Like, he doesn't know what to do with all these feelings. So it comes out in other forms that it shouldn't. And that's the thing with also, I noticed with reading the book with Harry that really drove me insane, is how insensitive and inconsiderate towards his brother William he is. Because do you think... William doesn't miss his mom, doesn't grieve for his mom. It's so, it's beyond entitled. It's like his pain is the only pain in the world. Like, but what about uh, William? And even uh, Charles, like, don't you think they miss Diana or felt some kind of loss? Especially William, who's literally just a couple of years older than him. But the thing with Harry, he's so, I don't want to use the word spoiled, but I'm going to use the word spoiled because it's, there's this sense of entitlement and this this uh, entitlement to complain and just whine and think everything revolves around you. But the real question is, why is grief so hard to talk about? And I think the reason is because grief is still to a certain extent taboo or misunderstood in our society. Because our knee jerk reaction towards grief is how to fix it. And that there's a time limit that we need to just make it go away as soon as possible. But we're gonna get into all of that. Hey guys, I'm in denial, your drag therapist, your favorite drag therapist, and as I always say, I'm in denial, so you, Harry, can wake up. Wake up, bitch! Yep. When you're in the depth of grief, like deep down in it, all you want is the other person back. Like, you don't want to hear anything else. You just want to get the love of the person that you lost. Harry writes he and his brother weren't satisfied with the results of a 2006 investigation concluding Diana's driver, Henri Paul, had been drinking. William and I considered reopening the inquest because there were so many gaps and so many holes in it. Would you still like to do that? Would I like to do that now? It's a hell of a question, Anderson. Do you feel you have the answers that you need to have about what happened to your mom? Truth be known, no. Yeah, this book is coming from someone who is not only deeply tortured, but in desperate need of grief counseling. But on another level, it is so annoying because of the lack of insight in it. And there's only one moment, one fleeting moment of um, insight. And it was that moment when he was talking to his therapist about his mother and he said this, you see pain is all I have left. I'm afraid without the pain, she might think I've forgotten her. That is sad on so many levels because how many of us know what it's like to be so um, used to feeling low and bad about yourself that Letting go of it is frightening because what are you without the pain? Like this, it's just, it went straight in when I read that. And also it's sad on another level because he talks about her as if she still exists, like somewhere like watching him and thinking thoughts about him. That is like, oh, Harry. But that's literally the only moment in the book, girl, because 
And I kind of wish the book was about that, about his pain. That would have been beautiful and honest and sincere because then he can talk about his feelings. Because this book, even though it's masking itself as some kind of like evidence of how William and the rest of the royal family have wronged him, but none of that is there. It's just all his feelings. And I wish he was more honest with himself and just wrote a book about how he felt towards his mother and what that loss is like. Because the moments where he talks about his mother are the best. But in order to write such a book, Harry would have needed to have some distance which can only be done in proper therapy and actual grief counseling, where he can put that pain, like feel it, of course, go through it, and then leave it in a place and look at it from a distance and then write a book, a moving story about it. But instead, no, he's just one with the pain, one with the past. And you can already tell from the opening quote. The second I read that, I was like, uh-oh, here we go. This is basically someone who is just proudly saying, I'm living in the past without even actually not proudly saying because that would have been also kind of intelligent to say you know what i'm just still stuck in the past i'm in my sadness leave me alone that would have been also an angry but a good kind of angry book with some honesty and self-reflection but instead no he just thinks he's completely entitled to just live in the past yeah this book is all mixed up in diana not only is he trying to connect with her like by going to the tunnel where she died and all those kind of things but he's literally retracing her steps and going to these psychics. Well, yes, because he knew that his mother did the same thing. His mother regularly visited psychics and spiritualists to find out answers to questions. And by the way, that opening quote for the book by William Faulkner, he found it on Brainy Quote. And he literally wrote that. There's a section in the book where he's talking about how he found the quote on, like, aren't you embarrassed to write that? And that's why at some points I'm thinking like, the ghostwriter who wrote the book I'm thinking, is he taking the piss? How could he just let Harry write all these things that make Harry look pretty childish? Because Harry's not very bright, is he? Oh no, the IQ is not IQing. Mm -mm. And by the way, he's deeply insecure about his level of intelligence. And he references it more than once. And he calls himself at one point unscholarly. And he knows that like William, just like Charles, are like the reading types. And at some point when he's talking about uh, completing his education at Eton, which was a struggle, like when he finally graduated, no small feat for one so unscholarly. And that's one of the many instances where you can tell how, not only how deeply insecure Harry is, but how jealous he is of William. But we'll get to that in a minute. And back to that childlike behavior of Harry, he really is like a child because when he talks at several points about how basically unable Charles is to show him affection or hug him, which for me, like, actually, King Charles came off very sympathetic in this book. I don't know if it's intentionally or not, but he painted the portrait of Charles as someone who's has so much love to give to his sons, but he doesn't know how to give it. And that's really, I was like, ah. That's also another touching moment in the book when Charles comes to his bedside to just tell him that uh, Diana died and he puts his hand on his knee and doesn't know how to hug him. Like for me, if you were a grown man, like if Harry was a grown man, a truly someone who's, you know, healed this and done the work and moved on, he would see that how difficult it is for Charles to actually show this kind of love. And that's why I think Harry is still a child because just like children, he's incapable of seeing the full picture. Because if he was, he'd see that Charles was really trying, but couldn't. And yeah, I really felt a lot of compassion for, for Charles. And maybe because I miss my own dad and like so, yeah, I'm projecting my own stuff onto it. But I don't think his dad is toxic in any way. I'm sure there are parents who are toxic, but this doesn't sound like it. And let's say the royal family, whether it's Charles or William and all of them are so toxic. If your family is so toxic, move on. Just go, girl. But you're not. You keep coming back for round two, three, four, five. Like just, yeah, you want to be happy. You want to find peace. You found the woman that loves you. Yeah, go love her and just go. And by the way, this is not the last time. Harry's gonna come back for more. Not only did he sign a multiple book deal, which is usually common with publishers, but in the last part, in the acknowledgements, he's, when he's telling the, the reader, uh, thank you for allowing me to share my story, he literally says, I'm grateful to be able to share it thus far. Guys, it's not over. He's coming back for more. Yeah, he's not done. <laughs> sibling rivalry. And speaking of sibling rivalry, that's where I think that's that makes up the that's the backbone of the book, unfortunately. Like how jealous he is of William. And he thinks and he keeps talking about William as if William is jealous of him. It's like
Yeah, this deep root jealousy of William, that's for me, it's like such a waste of energy and such a distraction from an opportunity to see that you both are in pain, but just showing it and manifesting it in different ways. But it's just, he's just so convinced that William is out to get him, which is kind of ironic because one of the things that he wrote is when uh, William got married, he says, I was forced to look inward because I always thought I'd be the first one to get married. Girl, that is the opposite of looking inward. That's literally competition. <laughs> that's not looking inward. And that's what's hilarious to me about the book, like how he just in this very smug way, he just describes that William is just, you know, jealous. And aren't we done with, aren't we tired of this childlike jealousy? You're the one who's jealous. No. Oh, don't give me, you're not jealous. You're so jealous you can hardly breathe. Yeah, that was me as Beth Midler from uh, Beaches. I did a drag remake of that uh, movie. Check it out. <laughs> yeah, his resentment towards William, that, that jealousy over things that were done more than like 20 years ago, he still talks about them as if they are the present tense, not only in the book, but in the promotional tour for the book. Like, I haven't seen you for ages. Now we get to hang out together. He's like, no, 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 when we're at school, we don't know each other. And that was him talking about basically the time at Eton, at that boarding school where, because Harry's a couple of years younger, so when he joined, William was already at that school and he just told him, just let's avoid each other, which is like, he would, William was 15. He was a, like, any teenage boy would be like embarrassed to talk to their younger sibling. Like, that's just normal. And the fact, I can understand you were pissed off about it back then, but he still talks about it as if it's happening right now. That wound is fresh, honey. Yes. And you get a sense from reading this book that this is a man for whom the emotions are always heightened. Like everything is always at a hundred. Like even when the things are so trivial, like when he talked about the, when Meghan Markle wanted the tiara and they had to get the tiara, of course, from the queen. And uh, for that, they had to communicate with Angela, her personal assistant and uh, dresser. And he literally writes in the book at some point, like she had the tiara, she held all the cards. And I'm like, you're 40 years old. You're talking about a tiara, girl. And that's what's shocking to me about the book is that if these things were put out in tweets, like you can tell, okay, in the heat of the moment, you know, we just tweet something and we put it out there. But this is a book that had to have been proofread several times. And you thought these things are actually okay to write and you're not embarrassed by them. There are plenty of examples of that. But just this with the tiara, it's like, girl, girl. And another example of how the emotions are unnecessarily heightened is when him and William were talking to um, the press about sharing a room and William was joking around about how much Harry snores. I cut in lies, lies that only made them laugh harder. Willie too. Harry, 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 Harold. And the pettiness definitely doesn't end there. There's so many examples, you guys. At some point I'm like, yeah, the ghostwriter is taking the piss because this is embarrassing and cringe. Like at some point when William was wanted to talk to him about Megan and Harry writes, like, William didn't ask about my day. He just said Megan was rude. Like, yeah. But the absolute worst when he talks about William's hairline, he actually describes it at some point, like his alarming baldness and his fading looks. Not once, twice. It's like, is that really a critique? Is that something you want to write? Like, what is this? The housewives? Are you not embarrassed? And at some point he talks, he compares his uh, private secretary, Ed Fox, to um, William that they have similar baldness, unlike his. He's not losing his hair just as fast. And by the way, speaking of Ed Fox, Ed Fox, when, um, what's her face? When he got married to Megan, he gave her a 30 page dossier of how to behave and the rules and the do's and the don'ts. So about that thing with the curtsy that she didn't know how to curtsy, hmm. Girl, no. Yeah, the thing is with Harry, he can't stop comparing himself to William. And that's where the trouble is. But uh, Abraham Hicks would like to tell him a couple of things. You don't even, we love you so much, you don't even do a good job of believing in what other people have received. You just make stuff up. Well, they got it because. <laughs> look at that. Look at that wonderful life that that person is living. But they inherited it. Lazy lazy they struggled not one bit they don't deserve it and we say ah they deserve it 
And this pettiness doesn't just stop at uh, William. It's actually, he directs a lot of it at the media and this guy can hold a grudge. Like really like, like school children fighting. Like he remembers not only the date and the title of every article has been written about him and Megan in the tabloids, but like the names of the editor and what they said and what they intended. Like at some point he talks about this tabloid editor, like he calls her the infected posture on the arse of humanity and she's focusing all her power on me and she's hunting despair and she will not rest until my balls are nailed to her wall like first of all this hunting despair business like you're the one who decided to call yourself a spear like you literally titled a book about your life like this is how you summed up your entire existence your memoir which is like a summary of who you are as despair you're the one who's hung up on that so I don't think every tabloid editor in the world is out there just like wanting to hunt the spare. They're just doing their job. Sure, it's a f maybe you, you look at it as an immoral or a f job, but like it's not that personal. And another article that he writes about that he can't forget about, like how Megan's flowers put Charles' uh, life at risk. Well, just ignore it. Like who cares? But that's the thing he can't. This is a deeply insecure man who's actually enslaved by what the media think of him. He cares so much. What people think of him is his entire existence. Like, can't you just picture him and Megan just sitting around Googling themselves and what people are writing about them? These two look like the saddest creatures. Like just, what did that person say about me? Let me sue them. <laughs> Shut up, go be happy. Yeah, he supposedly hates the media or thinks they're the scum of the earth, yet he values their opinion so much. Like one of the biggest catalysts for why he decided to, to launch this campaign of defending Megan and calling out the press and even calling out his family for not protecting Megan from the press is something that the Huffington Post wrote. And he writes about this in the book. Like the Huffington Post wrote that his silence is unforgivable when it comes to the bad coverage about Megan. Yeah, who gives a fuck? And another thing that Harry does unconsciously to avoid grieving is getting lost in magical thinking. It's his way of escaping. And I think a lot of us know what it's like to, you know, we just get lost in our fairy tales and the future and what we want our lives to be, like to avoid our pain. But Harry takes it to a whole other level. Yeah, and Harry is, of course, a tortured, sad person who's been through a lot and he wants to heal, I'm sure on some level, but he just keeps getting strung along by people who are just milking him for all his worth. Like he's surrounded by people who know that the more he gets stuck in this, the more he has things to say, the more money they make. And actually that's a, ironically, a very big similarity between him and his mother, Diana, because that iconic interview that she did, where she was basically deceived into giving that interview, that kind of reminds me of Harry a little bit. And I think I mentioned this in the review of the documentary that ha Harry has arrested development. And I'm definitely not the only person who thinks that he's still that 12 year old boy. But there's this one clip from the um, funeral, his lost expression, like what he wants to do. I feel he's still that boy. Like that look is still who Harry is. Just not knowing what to do. Yeah, he's very confused about what he wants. I'm sure on some level, like he says in the promotional interviews for the book that he wants peace, but he's he's very confused. Again, because he's not in touch with what really needs to be felt that's deep down inside. But whether the book achieves the peace or not, the ghostwriter definitely got Random House Publishing their money's worth. Taking away the content and the constant whining and the lack of insight that's almost like, huh? It's actually well written, like some, some, like in terms of prose and, you know, sentence structure and stuff. It's, it's very nice. Like there's one point where he's looking back on how his mother felt about him. Like she, in one of the interviews, she said that she's obsessed with him and William with her kids. And he goes, well, mommy, vice versa. I just thought that was beautiful. Just so simple. I, I love simple writing that just goes straight to the heart. Yeah, but back to the magical thinking, he even, he really thinks he's living in this movie. He keeps referencing it that I'm married to this American actress and the royal family doesn't accept us. At some point, he even compares himself to uh, King Edward and Wallace Simpson, the one who abdicated the throne to marry the American. He's just making these parallels. Like he really, he really lives in a story, which is to his detriment. And that story is really bringing him down. And for me, the biggest sign of Harry's magical thinking is when he starts writing about uh, Megan, which is in the third section of the book, because the book is in three sections. It's like there aren't chapters. There's like many chapters, but in three big sections. And the last big section is called Captain of My Soul about Megan. Girl, more like the prison guard keeping your soul captive. 
but anyway. Yeah, that section starts with a conversation with the moon about Megan. Like, okay, again, that's, I mean, nice and poetic, but like, what is this? What are we talking about? Like, you're having conversation with the moon. That's just your feelings. Delusion. <laughs> Convince yourself. So the moon told him that Megan is the right one for him. And another sign why he thinks this is a good match is because their conversations, his and Megan's conversations, started on what would have been Diana's 55th birthday. Okay. Yeah, the way he sees Megan is unlike the way anybody else in the world sees Megan. Like, he talks about her as if... First of all, he describes that show, Suits, the show that Megan was on, as if it's Breaking Bad. Like, he says that William and Kate were super fans of the show, but were embarrassed to tell uh, Megan. And that when Megan met the Queen, all the people surrounding the Queen were acting like they don't know who Megan is. Girl, you didn't marry Angelina Jolie. Calm down. Like, I mean, I love everything pop culture. I follow pop culture to an embarrassing degree. Like, I know the names of the managers of people like uh, Justin Bieber, but I've never heard of the show Suits. Like, nobody knows Suits. <laughs> Harold! Yeah, and he keeps going on and on about her success and that she had a website with tens of thousands of readers. Like, okay. I don't think they were ever expecting me to get, or to, become, uh, to get into a relationship with, with uh, someone like Megan, who had, you know, a very successful career. Who are you trying to convince, honey? This is the Megan section of the book review. I'm gonna stop soon because I'll throw up if I keep talking about her for too long, but uh, bear with me a minute. And one of the first things that got him hooked, like the things that Megan said is what she wants to do with her life is help people do good and be free. What is this, a Hallmark card? Who talks like that? Ah! And then he was touched by, they had a neighbor called Mr. R who lost his son and Megan went out of her way to get the man flowers and give him condolences for losing his son. Yeah, she abandoned her father. By the way. Anybody can buy a bouquet of flowers. <sighs> Go check on your father, honey. Yeah, and this magical thinking of Harry's, like, uh, in relation to Meghan, like, he talks about how, um, at some point, he was telling William how, um, mommy helped me find Meg. And William was like, I wouldn't go that far. Like, calm down. And he got so hurt about that. Like, yeah, your brother makes sense. Like, this is a very fantastical way of thinking. And it's a very valid response. Mummy, find me Meg. Like, what? <laughs> and another one. I'll be done with Megan soon, but hold on. And when he and Megan were getting close to getting married, like, she was being written off the show Suits that she was on, this very successful show, Suits. And he writes in the book that it was very decent of the show Suits to marry her off instead of throwing her down a shaft, which is what many people want to do. Who? Who, Harry? Who wants to kill your wife? Like, isn't that extreme? Like, aren't you embarrassed when you think, like, don't you question your thoughts a little bit? Like, who wants to kill her? Like, literally... Yeah, a lot of people online say, go die. Like, just don't read the comments, Harry. Yeah, and this hysteria he has over Meg, it's really insane. Like, it comes out, like, the core of it comes out, like, what, what it's actually about, what he's actually fearing in a conversation that he writes in the book about between him and his father. When his father was just telling him, don't read it, darling boy, like, just leave it. And he says, it's not that simple. It actually is. That's good advice that your father is telling you. Like, nobody can stop the media from writing what they want to write. But then his true fear comes out with that she might either decide I'm not worth the bother and basically leave him or harm herself in some way. Uh, neither of those are going to happen because you are of big use to Megan, so she's not leaving. Not yet, at least. And there's a whole section in the book that's kind of like the lead up to the Captain of My Soul chapter, where he talks about how the lead up to meeting Meg and like these, you know, string of pointless relationships that weren't going anywhere that he was having. And then he fell into a big depression where he was watching the show Friends all the time. It was on in the background. He goes on and on, and on about the show Friends quite a lot. Which I have to tell you, I relate to because throughout my 20s, I was working a job I did not like, like in a kind of corporate advertising job in Dubai. I hated my life, but I was not ready in any way to change it. And I was on a diet of Xanax pills, just a continuous stream, slow but steady stream. I mean, I was standing upright and working, but you know, I was barely conscious. And I would just work, work at that job and then come back home take some more pills and just fall asleep as I was watching the show Friends. And for me, Friends is like, I mean, it's cute, it's funny, whatever, but like 
whenever I hear anyone describing like watching friends like a zombie, I'm like, mm mm. So he was in this deep depression and enter Megan. Because there is no way a healthy, mature man could put up with her shit. She needed a little boy like this. By the way, a little sidebar. Megan, well, definitely not a sidebar actually. It just sums up the whole book. Megan is the one who gave him the idea to call the book Spare. Because somewhere towards the end when they were getting, uh, when their second baby was getting born, Megan wrote this poem, which is just like Megan to write a poem when she's having birth. Girl, just have birth. My love, she said, that is not a spare. This for me is the biggest proof that she's the one who planted the idea in his head to call the book the spare or convince him that he is a spare, that his whole existence is a spare because she couldn't be with someone who's an actual heir or someone who thinks for themselves. She needs to be with a follower. Yeah, and the biggest sign of this magical, confused way of thinking is when in the promotional tour of the book, he suddenly decided to backpedal on the racist claims. Now, suddenly, uh, the royal family isn't racist. In the Oprah interview, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even, Rhythm. well, of the British press said that. Right. And I love how Tom Brady is like, right. Hmm. This whole campaign that you guys launched with the Oprah interview two years ago that ended with you winning an award for fighting racism in New York, that was based on the fact that you're fighting racism in the royal family. So now to say that the royal family isn't racist, what? Huh? And I think one of the reasons he's doing that is because I think behind the scenes, he's trying to get back in in the good graces of the royal family. So now he's suddenly backpedaling, but girl, this is so... And that's why it's very difficult for Harry to move forward is because this contradictory way of thinking reflects an inner confusion. And like, he doesn't know, he, he does want, he says he wants peace, yet he keeps attacking his brother. He calls them racist, then he backpedals. Like there is this confusion because he's actually, he's probably doing it unconsciously, he's not aware. And I think uh, Abraham Hicks has a couple of words about that. I want this. I want that. I would like to have that. But. Oh, lovely. But. No power in that. And the reason that there's no power in it is because you killed the momentum right away. So the more you allow a thought to flow without resisting it with the contradictory thought, then the more speed it picks up, the more energy it attracts. Are you getting the sense of what we're talking about? So if you are thinking a thought about something you really, really want, and your conclusion is it hasn't come yet and is too slow in coming, then you think about it with such a mix of resistance that nothing changes. It just stays in its same relationship with you. You want it, but you want it, but. That's the kind of stuff that sticks in your mind forever. And now onto another technique that Harry uses to avoid feeling his grief. It's this deflecting of the blame and projecting onto other people. Yeah, in the book, he constantly keeps writing about how his family members, like his brother and his father, and even his stepmother, are collaborating with the press, leaking stories, but you're literally writing a memoir and promoting it on the world's biggest media outlets, talking about your family, sharing things that are not yours to share. Like how his father was always holding on to a teddy bear because he was scared. It's like, fine, if you want to do that, get your coin. But you're literally talking about your, your critique against your family is that they like did you wrong with the press, but that's what you're doing. Not only are you collaborating with the press, you pick the biggest outlets like Oprah, Anderson Cooper. Like, you're also collaborating with the press. This is a man who is, because he's unwilling to look at his pain, he's unable to actually see himself. Like at some point in the book, he described, he says that his father is going overboard for the sake of a woman, Camilla. You've literally abandoned your whole family. You've started this whole thing for, for the sake of a woman. So you're literally doing the same thing, but he just can't see himself. And another bit of very funny irony in the book is when he talks about how he's always going on about how he doesn't trust the press. Yet at some point he writes that he knows that the, uh, the royal family were leaking stories to the press because an insider in the press told him that uh, Charles and Camilla were leaking stories. So now you believe them? Like what? 
and these leaps of logic that he makes that are so fantastical and hurtful and also dangerous, not just towards other people, but to himself, like to think these thoughts. At some point he writes, then again, maybe our mother would be here if she hadn't married Pa. Like so indirectly blaming his father. And also another point in the book, he blames Camilla. First of all, he blames Camilla for the divorce, which is okay. And then the divorce somehow caused his mom to die. So Camilla is the one who caused his mother's death. Huh? But the most ridiculous example of deflecting blame and projecting is when he blames William and Kate for him wearing the Nazi costume to the party. They laughed and howled and I'm sure you've read this in so many excerpts in the book because it's one of the juiciest uh, yeah, reveals, but take ownership. You wore the Nazi costume. Like, how could you, like, even, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, wow, Harry, Harry, wow. And he's not the only one projecting because he's joined by a wife who's, has a PhD in projecting. Like at some point he, she actually is giving advice. He writes in the book about Megan giving advice to her father. Like, don't listen to them. Don't read the press. Don't speak to them, daddy. Like you forget about the press. And at one point he writes about him and William being in separate cars and Harry looking from the back window because his car was in the front and he saw William future King of England plotting his revenge like that sentence is wrong on so many levels and is so revealing and telling about what you're scared of what you hold dear first of all how much you hate that the fact that your brother is going to be future King of England and this plotting his revenge that's such a projection like how do you know what he's doing back there that's you, you, honey, plotting your revenge, plotting this book that you were reading now, unfortunately. There was one section in the book where after his mom died, he went with his dad to South Africa where the Spice Girls were performing. Like the hypocrisy, because this is beyond just projecting. This is just, first of all, he describes the Spice Girls as people who were just in desperate need for attention and they were just loving the the flashlights and he was just like ah oh, what is this and that's so hypocritical because that's what you're doing now like for any celebrity the flashlights and the media attention is what pays the bills that's what and that's literally what you and megan are doing constantly and but the worst part of irony about that is that how they he was so grossed out by the spice girls comparing their mission to what nelson mandela was doing and the tone deafness of that given that megan markle actually compared her marriage to uh, Prince Harry, like Mandela's release from prison. Are you not? That, this is another example where I think the ghostwriter is really taking the piss. Because having a pair of fresh eyes, like those of a ghostwriter or an editor, would like question you on stuff. Like, I can't believe that guy didn't see the joke in this. But for me, the worst technique that Harry does to, you know, avoid feeling pain is this intentional vagueness him and megan just throw stuff whether it's in the interviews or here in the book and just let people draw their own conclusions and they can just backpedal like that thing with the racism i found that so manipulative because if there was indeed one member of the royal family who raised concern that your son was going to be black yeah, that's really effed up and you should have called them out by their name but if it was just an exaggeration and which is what you're saying now, that n nobody was racist. Like, that's even worse. And you just let it hang there in the air for two years, let the media just call it racist when you knew very well that that's what the media would do. When you say that someone is concerned that you're about the skin color of your baby, that's racism. And the fact that you just let it hang there and now are telling us that the royal family is not racist, that's really manipulative. And another example less dangerous of this kind of like throwing something, but, and, and, just intentionally vague and just letting the audience draw their own conclusion is when he talks about the joke he writes about it in the book the joke that his father made about i'm not sure whether i'm your father because a little uh, backstory there was a rumor that major hewitt was uh, harry's father and not uh, charles but when charles said that he was referencing this person who is in a mental asylum called Broadmoor who was saying who'd always say oh I'm I'm Charles you know I'm Prince Charles clearly a person who's not well and his father was joking about this man to Harry saying oh he thinks he's me who knows maybe I'm not your father so to kind of like give the implication that your dad is trying to feed that rumor that 
major hero it was your father it's so it casts you your father and your mom in a bad light like it's not necessary but the cringiest parts of the book is when he paints himself as a hero Ugh. oh my god it's like just throughout the story like when the royal military academy selected him based on his psychological toughness and leadership skills that's funny tell another one yeah. and just how he paints a portrait of himself throughout the book as this kind of fearless soldier at some point he says this cadets dropping under pressure others feared they were next i never did however i never wavered and even in the points when he's not writing about his time in afghanistan he manages to throw it in that he's a soldier like, is it my inner soldier assessing every space as a potential battlefield? Like, ugh. And in another section where he's talking about the time in Africa when there was a leopard that showed and everyone ran except for him, he said, I didn't. I took a step towards it. Really, Harry? You have no fear? You write in great detail about the panic attacks that you're having just before getting on stage, which is fine. I know all about panic attacks, but like to paint yourself as this fearless person who's just... And yeah, at some point when they're talking about an explosion in during the war, I felt it in my brain. I looked around. Everyone was on their stomachs, except me. You're a soldier, Harry. And this book, by the way, is just as confused as that Netflix documentary where on some level it's this sad act of revenge, which is fine if that's what you want to write about. But then it's just this peppered with these happy little stories. Like in the documentary, they focus on the wedding. Here he just like randomly starts talking about what a hero he is and telling us about how he lost his virginity and doing, which is cute if that's what you want to write about. But it makes no sense in this book. And there's, he writes about his penis a lot, about how he was circumcised and just the, the, the cringe factor in that is like, oh, my penis was the subject of uh, public curiosity. Like who, who writes that? It's so smug and arrogant to think that the public is being cu is curious about your penis. We're not, it's gross. Even people who like penises are not curious about yours. And he keeps talking about like, he lost because he got circumcised like later in life, like he, I lost my penis because it was frostbitten. And at some point, he actually writes about the cream that he applied to his penis in the same paragraph as writing about that cream being used by his mom on her lips. Why do you want to make that association, Harry? Why? Why? Harry? Harold! Basically, this book, what it is in reality, is just the diary of a very angry, vengeful, spiteful man who just wants to tell everyone that I know you wronged me and I still remember, and which is fine, but it's such a missed opportunity because underneath all that is this sadness that you need to touch and feel and just grieve and just have a good cry and really feel it. Go back there to the loss of your mom and really feel it. Not in blaming who did this to your mom, who caused her death. Just feel the loss of your mom because that's a lot to lose as a child. Instead of getting hung up on who... Nobody killed your mom. Yeah, certain events led to her death, but nobody wanted her dead. And even if they did, how is that serving you? And how is getting angry at your brother serving you? Yeah, this could have been such a poignant, beautiful book about grieving and how it's done. Yeah, and at some point it's funny, he talk, he writes about um, having met the families of the victims of 9-11 and he tells them, grief is a thing best shared. Yes, Harry. Practice what you preach. And I think what we have to do for people like Harry and everyone else to start, you know, accessing their grief and feeling it and for people to allow themselves to do that, we have to normalize grief in all its types, in all its stages and all its manifestations and however form it's showing itself, especially for children. And there are two things to remember when it comes to grief. First, when you lose the love of someone, only love and connection with other people can heal that. Not fighting with people, but actually to form loving uh, connected relationships. Not like the one with Megan. And second, we need to find a way to express that grief directly. Otherwise it gets stuck and interferes with the rest of your life, the way it has done for Harry. And lastly, Abraham Hicks, who's also known as Esther Hicks, 
would like to give advice to not just Harry, anyone who thinks like Harry, anyone who's stuck comparing themselves and not accessing how they feel. Esther gets it that different people are having different exposure to life. And so all day, every day, Esther and those like her, you guys are having exposure to life. That's letting you know you are powerful creators and a non-physical energy who is on your side, who is promoting the things that you care about. But this law of attraction is an across the board, very even deal where you get what you think about, whether you want it or not. And when you think I want that, and then you are thinking, but now there's a difference from your inner beings point of view and your butt thought from your point of view. And that's what equals the contradiction in energy, which is the reason that you feel the way you feel.